Hi, my name is Michael Strahan. I'm the owner of AlaskaHuntPlanning.com. We are a hunt consultation service that is designed to provide custom hunts for people that are interested in coming to Alaska either for the first time or people that have perhaps hunted in Alaska before but need a little bit of additional help in getting to a good area. Alaska is the largest state in the country with the greatest variety of game animals of any other state but also the lowest density per square mile of any state in the country. That comes as a surprise to most big game hunters who've been reading about Alaska for most of their lives and dreaming about coming here. But when you get here, if you don't know what you're doing, you're probably just going to end up with a very expensive camping trip. Our job is to work closely together with you to make sure that doesn't happen. A successful Alaska hunt has a lot to do with local knowledge and local connections. We bring both of those to the table, sit down, look at your expectations, your goals, plans, and dreams. We align those with Alaska realities so that you can have a successful hunt. Let's take a few minutes and look at the details of what's included in our hunt planning service. To begin with, you have ongoing contact with our staff all the way through the planning process. And what that means is that we schedule our meetings together, whether they're in face or whether they're over the phone. Uh, if you're local in the Anchorage area, we can do face-to-face -face meetings with you certainly. Uh, but if you're from outside the state, most of our meetings are done over the telephone. We'll do conference calls if we need to. Usually we have one person who's the point of contact for a group, and then we rely on that person to disseminate the information to the rest of the people in the party. But the point is that you have ongoing contact with us all the way through the planning process. That means anytime you have a question about something, you're not sure of something, you've heard something, or you're, you're kind of conflicted over the area that we've looked at, or whatever it is, uh, you, we're available to you to coach through all of those issues and talk about those and make sure that what you end up with is exactly what you're hoping for. Alaska is the most expensive place in the country to hunt, so it's really important to pay attention to the finances. We work really closely with you on the budget so that you don't end up with unexpected surprises at the end. Uh, so what we do is we have a detailed list of everything that's going to potentially cost you and we look at each one of those items. Once we get the budget put together, then we go back and look at that again and see if there's some ways we can trim off of that budget to save you money. Another thing that we do is uh, we have a number of books and DVDs on our website that directly um, that can be directly useful in your hunt depending on what you're hunting. We've got books and videos on caribou hunting, we've got books and videos on moose hunting, brown bear hunting, black bear hunting, doll sheep, whatever it is you're looking for we've got something, some resources that we can make you aware of. You may already have some of those tools uh, or you may need to accumulate some of those. In addition to that, there's an entire hunt planning library on the Outdoors Directory website and we'll walk through those tools with you. There's some things that you're going to need regardless of where you're hunting in the state and other tools that are just sort of a niche market thing that only applies to specific types of hunting. So we'll go over those tools with you to make sure you have everything you need during the planning process. We spend quite a bit of time talking about the timing of your hunt. Uh, we find with some groups you're locked in because of work commitments and so on and so you have to come during a specific time and that's fine, we'll work with that. In other situations we have more flexibility. So depending on the species you're hunting and the type of hunt that you're doing, uh, we may need to adjust the timing one direction or the other so that it uh, increases your chances of success. So we spend quite some time on the uh, timing. In addition to that, we talk about the species that you're looking for on your hunt. Of course, that seems like a basic fundamental, but what we find out is a lot of people that are coming to Alaska may only come here one time, or at least they're only planning on coming here one time. It's that once-in-a-lifetime trip that you come back again and again. So what we do is we work with you on multi-species hunts. A lot of guys come up here, they want to hunt moose and caribou, or uh, they'll combine caribou with black bear or some other kind of combination. So we talk about multiple species hunts and how, it, how important it is that you select one primary species to focus on and then let everything else flow off of that. We have some areas that we can put you in, for example, on float hunts where you'll start off caribou hunting and then you float down into really good moose country. Bears can be found anywhere in places like that sometimes. So we work with you on all of that when we're talking about species to make sure that you have a primary species that you're focused on and then we wrap everything else around that so you end up with a really nice package. 
A critical component of our planning process has to do with area selection. And we have a lot of hunters out there that have the mistaken idea that all they have to do is get a good air charter reservation and a location and they're good to go. Uh, especially experienced hunters often fall into that trap. Well, the truth is if you've never hunted Alaska before, uh, it's not that way. And if you have hunted Alaska, you know that you've got to do a lot more than just show up. So the area selection is absolutely critical. And what we do is we work on a year to year basis with what's going on with the game populations in a given area. So we're not putting people in an area that used to be good, but is no longer uh, a factor. So we'll work with you very closely on the area selection, typically on the river trips. Uh, we'll throw out five or six or even a dozen river systems and then let you choose off of those rivers based on the criteria that we're working with uh, on those rivers as we begin to talk about each one and talk about the pros and cons, what you can expect in terms of guide pressure, hunting pressure, uh, difficulty of access, all of those factors we look at for each one of the river systems that we'll propose. And then uh, in the end, it's your choice as far as which one you want to go to. Once you've made your decision about the area, then we begin to work on the rest of the details. Typically the next thing in line after we get the location figured out is the air charter, another critical component. Uh, some of the air charters in Alaska, uh, regrettably, are not an operator that we would necessarily put you with. So we're gonna find the premium operators that do a really good job and also fit within your budget. So air charter selection is a crucial component of our hunt planning process. Now, not all of our hunts involve fly out. Uh, we can do hunts where you can fly in and get dropped off on a river and then float out to a highway bridge, or you could put in at a highway bridge and float out into an area where you have to be flown back. And hunts like that, uh, where we're trying to cut back on the budget, you're saving about half of your air charter fee, roughly, depending on which end you're doing your flying on. In addition to that, we can do bridge to bridge float trips where you put in at a highway bridge and you float down to another bridge. And on hunts like that, obviously, the only expense you've got is the vehicle rental and the fuel, substantially less money than flying out, but also the possibility of, of running into some company out there. By the way, speaking of running into people out in the field, that's not necessarily a deal breaker. Uh, we find many of the hunters that are out here in the field uh, may not even have any idea what they're doing especially the non-local hunters that are wanting to go on the big adventure uh, and do it all themselves. They may not have any idea how to hunt the river. So when we're working with you, we're going to give you the details that you need to know exactly how to unpack the secrets of that river. So when you get there, you're going to have a pretty good idea what you're doing. So area selection and air charter selection sort of go together. Um, another issue that we talk about is land ownership. We have a lot of private property in Alaska, but it's not fenced or posted. Yet it's your responsibility as a hunter to know who the land managers are and what hoops you need to jump through to get permission to hunt on that land. In some cases, the land is closed to hunting altogether and you're not going to be able to go there. In other cases, there may be a land use fee. So we need to look at those as we go through the planning process and make sure that you're not trespassing on private property without permission first. And second, if you are on private property, that you've talked to the appropriate individuals to get permission to hunt on that land. A key component of our planning process involves our maps. As far as we know, nobody is providing the level of detail that we provide on our hunting maps. What we do on the river trips is we mark your mileage ahead of time, including the drop-off point and the takeout point. And the reason why we do that is because as you're floating down the river, let's say you're, you're moose hunting and you're floating through um, low timbered country where you have a lot of brush and trees. You don't have any geographical landmarks to reference so you know where you are on that river. Now, if you're good with a compass and a GPS, you can pretty much figure it out. However, what we want to do is we want to mark the mileage and we do it every five miles on your river. So we start off at zero, which is your drop off point, and then we go five, 10, 15, 20, all the way to your takeout point. And the reason why we do that is because when you first start floating, let's say you get dropped off in an afternoon, you get the boat set up, you get your camp set up, have a nice dinner, and then in the morning, you do a little hunt around your drop off point. Most people will do that. They want to get out there and get started right away. But then about mid morning or so, you come back, you have a quick lunch, you pack up the boat and decide to float. Let's say it's one o'clock in the afternoon by the time you get off on the river. So you're gonna float for four hours. So you float one, two, three, four o'clock, you find a really good looking spot, you pull over. 
What we want you to be able to do is to mark the spot where you started floating by taking a position fix in your GPS. You float down for four hours, say, and then you take another position fix and you take that longitude line, or excuse me, that latitude line, if the river's flowing north-south, all you need is that latitude line. Wherever it runs across the river, that's where you are. So take a position fix when you stop, measure the amount of time that you floated, and then look at your map and you can tell how many river miles you floated. And you can use that number to extrapolate how long it's going to take to get to your takeout point. The reason why you need that information is because that's going to help you budget your time while you're on the river. So you're not wasting time um, drifting too slow and then you end up getting to your takeout point too late or you panic and you get there too early and you're sitting there for three days waiting for the plane to show up along with whoever else might have been floating that same river. So it's important that you know how to budget your time and we work with you on how to do that. So we put that information right on your maps for you so you know exactly where you are at any point in time. Another thing that goes on your maps, and this is a crucial part of the planning process, is the areas that you need to focus on when you're hunting particularly with moose. If you're hunting caribou, what we're looking for on a caribou hunt are migration corridors. So we look at that river drainage, we know something about the caribou migration paths in that area or migration patterns, which by the way change from year to year. Uh, generally, uh, for example, let's talk about the western arctic caribou herd. Typically what happens is the cows and calves spend their time up on the north slope of the Brooks Range. They move over the Brooks Range, which is to the south. The Brooks Range bisects the state of Alaska from east to west. So those animals will come up over the Brooks Range. They run into all those bulls that spent the summer up in the mountains. They drag the bulls down with them. The first river they hit is the Noatak. And then they move on farther south. They end up down in the Kobuk River, the Selawik River country. And then they eventually hook out to the west, out onto the Seward Peninsula. Then in the spring, the process reverses itself and the animals end up making their way back up to the Arctic Coastal Plain where calving takes place in the spring. Now, that's the general pattern of movement for the Western Arctic herd. The Central Arctic herd has movement patterns that are unique to that area, and so does the Porcupine herd and the 40 Mile herd and some of the other herds that we have in the state. They have certain patterns that they tend to follow year to year. What changes from year to year is the timing. So uh, years ago, the caribou in the Western Arctic herd used to hit the Kobuk River right in the middle of, uh, of caribou season in September, uh, early August to mid, early to late, uh, excuse me, late August to early September, and sometimes mid-September, you'd find caribou down in the Kobuk River country. Now they're not making it down there till quite a bit later. So we look at those variations that change from year to year, and we plan your hunt around that. On a moose hunt, it's a whole different ball game. Moose generally stay in the river drainage or in areas of good habitat. So what we do is we identify those areas of really good hunting habitat and we make sure that we mark those on your map so that when you get down to that area, you can focus your hunting efforts there. Typically, we'll have more areas marked on your maps than you're gonna have time to hunt. So what that means is that you can, get, you can get conceivably two or three hunts out of that same set of maps. So you can come back multiple times, hunt that same drainage, and probably never really have the same hunt twice. So we mark all that information ahead of time on our maps, which we send to you, and then we keep a duplicate set in our office, and then what we do is we'll get together with you on the phone, and we'll go through those maps mile by mile. We'll answer any questions that you have about uh, the markings that are on there, how we found out that that's a good place to hunt, for example. That's really important information to have. How do you know how to identify these places when you're out there on your own after you no longer need us? How do you find those good places to hunt? We spend a lot of time with our hunters talking about equipment. We'll send out a detailed gear list which is customized for the type of hunt that you're going on. And so we'll go through each item line by line. We start off with the, with the personal gear. That would be your clothing, the gear that you're going to personally use for hunting, your rifle, your optics, uh, your ammunition, all of that kind of stuff, field carry equipment. We go through your personal gear item by item and then we go into what we call the community gear which is your camping equipment the stuff that the whole group is going to use tents uh, tables cookware kitchen equipment all that kind of thing so we go over all that stuff detailed uh, off of a detailed list along the way we're going to talk about specific brand names of items that have worked really well for us in the field uh, in a guiding context usually 
but gear that's rugged enough to handle Alaska. Now, you probably already have a lot of hunting gear yourself, and you probably want to use a lot of it on your Alaska trip, of course. You've got an investment there. Uh, there's no sense spending money on something if it's going to work. And the key phrase there is, if it's going to work for Alaska. So we'll talk about what you have. We'll compare that to our list. And in some cases, we might want to weed a couple of things off of our list. In some cases, we might want to pull some things off your list and supplement with a, a new purchase or something like that. So we'll go over those items line by line to make sure that when you get here, you're fully equipped. A float hunt in Alaska is a lot like a road hunt in other states. And what I mean by that is when you get in your pickup and you drive out to go deer hunting, in fact, my father-in-law, we'll use him as an example. He was a dyed-in-the-wool road hunter. And uh, we used to go deer hunting in a place called Lapine, Oregon, over in eastern Oregon. We'd jump in his pickup and we'd drive down these old dirt roads and we'd cruise along about 30 miles an hour or so, but then all of a sudden he would slow down. We'd come into a beautiful little valley, he'd slow down, we'd drive along real slow, the windows would go down, we're looking out the windows. Didn't take me very long to figure out that Bill knew something about that area, and what he knew was that that was an area where we were likely to find a buck. So he knew those locations. What we would also do is we would pull over and park in some of those places, and then we would get out and we'd still hunt, or we would do a drive, or do whatever. Uh, whatever tactics were appropriate for that area. But these were places that he knew from past experience held deer. Look at a river in Alaska the same way. If you get in your boat and you just float down the river randomly and stop at random locations and hope to find moose, uh, you're like a lot of road hunters. The successful road hunters are the guys that know where to find animals. They use the vehicle to access that location. They get out of the pickup and then go out and hunt. That's what we want you to do on a river trip. We want you to know where those areas are. We call them prime zones. Know where those prime zones are. Pull the boat over, park, camp, hunt that area for two or three days. That's going to maximize your chances of success on the river. So we spend quite a bit of time with you on the maps and we go over that in great detail. Now chances are, if you're doing a float hunt and you're only going to do it one time in your life, you're probably not going to go out and spend $5,000 or $6,000 on a raft package. That means you're probably going to be renting your rafting equipment in a situation like that. If that's the case, we're going to plug you in with a reliable rental outfit that we've used in the past or that we personally can vouch for. Depending on what part of the state you're going to, we're going to give you a different rental outfit, of course. Uh, you don't want to rent a raft in Anchorage to do a hunt up in the Brooks Range when you've got a raft rental outfit that's a lot closer and cheaper for you. So we're going to look at who's in the area and who you should be using for your hunt. But we're not going to just turn you over to them and just say have fun. We're going to spend time coaching you through the process. Some raft rental outfits might forget something in the package. For example, when we send out a raft, we want to make sure that you've got two pumps. If you blow out a pump on the first pump stroke on day one, you're going to be inflating a raft with a trash bag. So you want to work off of a gear list and make sure that your rental outfit is uh, giving you the things that are on that list. So when you go to pick up your raft, you're going to go through that gear list one last time before you load everything on the airplane. The last thing you want to do is have your part. The last thing you want to hear after the plane leaves is, is your partner's voice going, hey, where's the pump at? Or where's the first aid kit? Or what have you. Now, some air charter companies will supply the rafting equipment as part of the deal, but you want to be careful about that. Some of them really know what they're doing and everything's going to be there. It'll be just fine. But some of them are going to have incomplete packages. The glue may have frozen in the past at some point because it got stored out in the gear shed over the winter. By the way, if the glue freezes, it's no good. Um, they, the package might not be complete. You might have a pump that hasn't been checked recently. It might have a leak. It might blow out on you. You might only get one pump. There might not be enough straps. There might not be a rafting frame. I know one air charter operator that was sending people out a group of two moose hunters was going out. They were getting a 14-foot uh, round boat and a couple of canoe paddles. No rowing frame, no rowing setup at all. So in a situation like that, if both guys shot a moose, you're looking at about 16 to 1,800 pounds of meat, antlers, gear, and hunters in a 14-foot self-bailing round raft. That's just not going to do the job. And you're not going to be able to control it with a couple of canoe paddles on a swift river. So what we do is we plan on maximum loads. Uh, if you've got two guys going on a moose hunt, I can guarantee you both of them are going to have a moose tag burning a hole in their pocket, and they're both going to want to shoot a moose. So we want to make sure that you have enough lift 
to hold both moves. And so on a group like that, we're not going to put two guys in a 14-foot sail bailing round boat and expect that you're going to get all of your camping equipment, both moves and both hunters and food and all your gear in there in one trip. It's just not going to happen. So if you're working with an air charter that supplies rafting equipment, we're going to work through that process with you. And again, we're going to work off of a checklist to make sure that you get everything that you need. When you arrive at the air charter, you're going to go through that list again and verify that everything is there that's supposed to be there. We don't want any surprises at the last minute. One really important part of your trip that's often overlooked is the expediting and shipping of your equipment to Alaska. In some cases, you're going to want to air freight your gear all the way out to the village from which you're going to fly out. In other cases, you might be able to get it all in your carry-on bag, depending on the type of hunt. Of course, if you've got rafting equipment, that's a whole different ball game, and you're going to have to get that shipped out to your air charter in some way. So we go over expediting and shipping to make sure that we're coming up with solutions that are uh, cost effective, but also from a practical standpoint that are going to result in you getting your equipment. Uh, for example, I don't generally use the U.S. Postal Service. And the reason why I don't is because they're not always reliable in terms of getting your stuff out there. I had a group a few years ago that disregarded this advice and uh, they were doing a hunt out of the McGrath area. As far as I know, last time I checked, they're still waiting for their gear to show up. And that was about five years ago. They shipped it through the Postal Service. What we ended up having to do, they called us on the satellite phone from out in McGrath, and we had to scramble around and put a camp together for them, and we got it out there and we were able to make the trip work. But you don't want to end up in that kind of situation. So we'll go through your shipping options. We'll talk about how much each one costs and so on, and how much lead time you need to give yourself before you ship your stuff out to the field and so on. So we get your stuff out there to the field, but let's talk about the backhaul. That's another area that can get overlooked. How are you going to get the meat, the trophies, all of your gear, uh, some of which may have come from a rental outfit? How are you going to get all that back to where it needs to go? So we cover all of that in detail with you to make sure you've got it all covered. A really important part of planning your hunt is dealing with emergencies that might occur in the field. Uh, God forbid that somebody should get hurt out there or something should happen, but things do happen from time to time. And so we want to make sure that you're prepared for that and that you have an action plan in place. Uh, a, cri a critical component of that action plan would be to leave a detailed hunt plan with somebody back home, for example. So you write all that information down, who's going on the trip, how many of you are there, what uh, medical expertise do you have, what kind of shape are you in, where are you going, all of those details, who are you flying with. You write all of that down and you leave that with somebody at home. We also keep a copy of that in our office. So if for some reason something doesn't go according to plan, uh, you don't show up on time, whatever the case is, we have enough information that we can get some help out there to you in the field. One area that we spend a lot of time with you on is the proper field care of your meat and trophies. We want to make sure that that meat makes it out of the field in fine shape so you've got a whole winter's worth of good eating on your hands. We also want to make sure that your big game trophies make it out so you don't have hair slipping or bald spots on your mount. We want, to have, we want you to have a really nice trophy that represents those memories that you had on your Alaska hunt. So we spend a lot of time going over proper skinning and caping, fleshing, the detail work on your hides that you need to do out there in the field. We talk about how to take care of the meat in the field. Uh, if the weather is unseasonably warm, for example, there are certain precautions that you want to take to prevent spoilage. If the weather is prematurely cold, if you have low freezing temperatures at night, uh, there are precautions that you need to take to prevent the meat from freezing too early. Uh, if the meat freezes too fast, there's a pH issue that happens internally within the muscle tissue. And if that, uh, if that pH doesn't change at the proper rate, the meat will toughen up and it'll be like eating rubber bands. So we want to make sure that you're aware of those issues and that you know what to do about them in the field. Hunting in Alaska is a challenging business, but planning an Alaska hunt can be just as challenging. My name is Michael Strahan with AlaskaHuntPlanning.com and I look forward to working with you on your Alaska hunt.